How do you draw the structure of phosphorus pentachloride and compounds like that? Well, getting to phosphorus trichloride is quite easy. As always, we're going to start with our Lewis dot structures. We're doing the electron dot notation for all the elements, all the atoms involved. Uh, phosphorus has five valence electrons, chlorines have seven, so chlorine and phosphorus can share and share and share. But the question is, there's now two more chlorines that we're going to need to bond. And there's no more uh, unbonding pairs to serve as a bonding site. So how can we explain how PCL5 is formed? There are two possible explanations. And both the explanations will only work if you have, if you're adding really electronegative atoms to less electronegative atoms. As in this case, because chlorine is definitely uh, highly electronegative and is definitely more electronegative than phosphorus. So, that applies to both explanations, so I'm not going to include it over one. So, the first explanation that could be possible to explain what's going on here. So, um, since chlorine is highly electronegative, it is really attractive to electrons. So these chlorines are attracted to electrons in the phosphorus, but they can't form a conventional bond because that would be uh, an unpaired electron from each one. That would be a half-filled orbital and a half-filled orbital combined, make a full short orbital, which is what you would have. Uh, here already. So, chlorine still attracts electrons, and it attracts electrons so strongly that these electrons are get pulled apart so they're no longer in the same orbital. They're in two different orbitals. That would give you something like this. Instead of having a non-bonding pair of electrons in one orbital, you have two lone pairs in individual orbitals. Then you could share like normal, and you would have a cleaned up structure that would look something like this. And if you look up a uh, Google search on phosphorus pentachloride PCL5, more than likely this is going to be what you're going to see as the structure for phosphorus pentachloride. There are a big problem though with this explanation. When I was saying that these electrons got split, so now they're in different orbitals, the question is, well, what is that extra orbital that's being used? See, you already have one, two, three, four. So you've got your s orbitals involved, your s orbital and your three p orbitals. So where to go if those are all filled? Well, one candidate is the d orbitals. Now you might be saying phosphorus doesn't have any d orbitals, but it has electrons 
that are in the third energy level. And they are d orbitals in the third energy level. And this explanation involves invoking using those d orbitals as part of your bonding to allow you to have more than four orbitals. So that's where the fifth orbital comes in. When you draw things like this, this phosphorus is sometimes referred to as being hypervalent, which means it has beyond an octet of electrons. Now, I am really critical of this theory. Uh, because this assumption that using d orbitals to me is a little bit far-fetched. Uh, and there's two reasons why. Uh, one, the difference in energy. Between uh, the 3p and the 3d is really large. So it's going to be very hard for them to kind of work together. And the second is there are examples of this happening involving second period elements. Now, the reason why that is a problem is if you're in the second period, there are no D sublevels available on the second period. So if that's the explanation, you can't use ones in the, in the third energy level because then you'd use S's or P's instead. And the difference between energy, between electrons in one energy level and other is really great you're never going to see that happening being forced on phosphorus by, say, chlorine. Uh, there's lots of evidence that is really against this when people are doing calculations about these sorts of things uh, and electro-orbital theory. Uh, you could explain less than 1% of the bonding in this situation inv with involving d orbitals. So, to me, that is not a very good explanation about how it is, but it is the most common representation for fossil pentyl chloride. And at one time, it was taught just this way before the evidence started to show up that this really wasn't working this way. So, let's look at the another possible explanation. And the second explanation starts the same way. Since chlorine is highly electronegative, more so than, than phosphorus, what's going to happen is this. If I start with a structure of phosphorus trichloride, here are the other two chlorines that I'm going to try to add in. Chlorine is highly electronegative, which means it's really, really attractive electrons. It sees phosphorus as a source of electrons. But it can't bond because that's a full orbital and that's an empty orbital, and you can only have two electrons in orbital. So if it can't share electrons with phosphorus, then it does the other method of getting extra electrons. Namely, it steals electrons. So Chlorine can steal one of these electrons, I'm using an X to represent the stolen electron, from phosphorus. Now that'll make this a phosphorus with a positive charge, and this chlorine has a negative charge. After you do that, then the other chlorine has a bonding site, a unpaired electron, and it can form just a normal conventional bond. So let me clean up this drawing a little bit.
So in this cleanup drawing, you can easily see that phosphorus has eight electrons around it. So it's not violating the octet rule. All those electrons can easily be explained by just using S and P orbitals. The extra chlorine, though, is still bonded to it because it has a negative charge and phosphorus has a positive charge and opposite charges attract. This is ionic bonding. So what happens in this uh, explanation uh, is you start off with the highly electronegative atom. They're going to first steal. And then they're going to share. So one chlorine, in this case, is stealing, and one chlorine is sharing. So if I look at this bonding, some of this bonding is covalent, and some of this bonding is ionic. And so I describe this type of bonding as partially ionic, partially covalent bonding. And it's actually more covalent than it's ionic in this case, but that's what's going on here. Uh, the advantages for this is it doesn't violate the octet rule. Uh, I use only, you know, the S and P sublevels, which are your normal valence electrons. I don't have to invoke any Ds. Um, the drawback is the structure is a little more complicated because the bonding here is actually a little bit more complicated than conventional straightforward covalent bonding. Um, the big drawback is if you look up phosphorus pentachloride, it's usually not represented this way. But it is the best explanation about what corresponds on with the bonding. So, why would something like this then be accepted? Well, the reason it's accepted is that in this drawing, you're representing all the phosphorus chlorine bonds as covalent bonds, even though it's not 100% covalent. You're just pretending like it is. So this ionic bond between this phosphorus and this chlorine, you're just pretending like it's going to be a fifth covalent bond. Uh, apparently, the way the rules are for drawing the structure and what's acceptable and what's not is that if a bond is at least somewhat covalent, you can represent it this way. So... I would accept either this drawing for phosphorus pentachloride or the more accurate drawing like this um, as two ways it can be represented. And a lot of things, both of these models would do a good job of explaining, though there's some details of the bonding and the structure when we look at the three-dimensional structures down the road where this is a better explanation than that. Now, if this only happened in phosphorus pentachloride, I don't think it would be a big enough idea to even bring up. But this actually happens quite often. So anything where you would end up having something to have more than octave electrons, this is really happening instead. Um, anytime you see uh, compounds involving, let's say, noble gases, this has to happen.